We're starting a new series today because I'm preaching quite a lot over the next few months until I go back to Springdale again in uh, mid-September. So uh, I'm, uh, we're going to be doing a new series and we're going to be looking at one of the strangest books in the Bible. In fact, it's a book that Christians, in my experience, very rarely look at. But it's a book that I enjoy immensely. And that you might want to have a look in the index for it. It's the book of Ecclesiastes. So it's just after Proverbs, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, or the index is always handy. Father God, as we look at your word this morning, I ask that you are going to speak to us. We don't just want to gain some information. We want some revelation about yourself. Father, open our eyes to see more clearly our context and our situation. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, because I've not been preaching for a while, you've got used to just being able to sit and listen. Uh, and, and do some thinking as well. Actively thinking. Okay. Well, now you're going to be actively thinking and actively talking because I've got three really difficult questions that we're going to look at as we go through today. Are you up for that? Yes. Are you up for that? Yes. It doesn't matter if you are or not. Absolutely. We're going to do that together because it's very important that we don't just read this strange book, that we understand what it means in our context and situation, what it means for you this week, what it means for the people around you. So we're going to do some work on that together. Is that okay? I'm very pleased that some of you said yes. This, uh, this book relentlessly asks tough questions about life. And it's questions that people prefer not to look at. And there's things that it says in this book that people would really prefer not to hear. It it seems include looking at how frail and fragile human life is. People like to go on living as though, you know, they're just going to live forever, that, you know, everything is fine, that you, you... you ask people, I was, I was reviewing a, um, a piece of translation this morning, which uh, um, been translated from, from Portuguese into, into English, and it's about the attitude of Generation Y to the future, which is sort of the youngest generation, and that they've got no sense of doing anything to be prepared for the future. It's all about now. They don't think about the future at all. And they just think that now is just going to go on forever and ever. But life is frail and fragile. And therefore, it's really important for us to seize the day. To seize the day. To grab the opportunities that are here today in God and make the most of those. This book is so relevant for today because it challenges the values of the societies in which we live, the cultures that are so that surround us, that we are a part of. It challenges those values so hard. And we're going to see some of that today as well. Now, we don't know who wrote the book of Ecclesiastes. We aren't terribly sure even when it was written. Though there are some clues in the language that's used. It was written, uh, as you may be aware, in Hebrew. Um, But in the, uh, I'm not a Hebrew scholar, so this is opinions based on reading other people. Um, There are some words that are some loan words. You you know, like in in English, we borrow words from other languages that sort of creep in. And those of you that speak other languages, you know there are languages that, words that creep in that have come from other, other languages. Well, in Ecclesiastes, there are a lot of words that have crept in from Persian. And there are also some unusual constructions, some unusual syntax in the Hebrew. And so those things imply that it probably wasn't written before 400 years before Jesus was born. 
So somewhere between three and four hundred years before Jesus was born was perhaps when it was written. It's got a timeless quality. That's one of the difficulties with dating it. It's, it's got this timeless feel. It's ever relevant. We know that the author was an admirer of King Solomon. And also the author thinks himself into the position imagining what life is like for people who don't actually believe in God. And we'll see that as we work through the passage we're looking at today. He relentlessly asks questions that undermine confidence or trust in human values, in human wisdom, in money, in possessions, in human pleasure or human justice. He chips away at it time after time after time. The title for today is Life is Meaningless. You did come along for some encouragement, didn't you, this morning? <laughs> Life is meaningless. So where does all this lead? We're not going to get to the end of Ecclesiastes today. And uh, so we're going to leave you sort of hanging partway through. But where he's going is to a clear affirmation of trust in God in the context of a life that at times doesn't make sense. And I think for a lot of us, that's actually our experience of life at times. It doesn't make a lot of sense. So he's working towards a statement of trust in God in a context of life that doesn't make sense. We don't get to that affirmation today. So today it's all about meaninglessness. Is that okay? Hmm. So we're going to start with chapter 1 and we're going through today to verse 11 of chapter 2. So the title is Life is Meaningless and this first section I've called Everything is Meaningless. That word meaningless occurs 37 times in these 12 chapters. And we'll have a look at what the word means in a few moments. So, here we go. Ecclesiastes, have you found it? Everyone got there? Ecclesiastes, chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. The words of the teacher, son of David, king of Jerusalem. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, Utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. That's a good start, isn't it? <laughs> the point of using Solomon's name, and it will come out a bit later on, is to try and show that even the wisest richest person in the world would conclude that without God, life is meaningless. Now that word that is translated in the NIV as meaningless, uh, the, the Hebrew word that underlines it, it literally means a vapour or a breath. Some translations, one other I was reading this week, uses the word smoke. Life is just like smoke. There's no substance. There's nothing there. Nothing of value. You feeling encouraged? What does a man gain from all his labour at which he toils under the sun? Generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the north, so sorry, to the south and turns to the north. Round and round it goes, ever returning on its course. All streams flow into the sea. Yet the sea is never full. 
to the place the streams come from. There they return again. All things are wearisome, more than one can say. The eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear its fill of hearing. Now, there's a phrase in verse 3 that is a key phrase in this book, which you need to understand. It's the phrase, under the sun. And it's a phrase that's got, in this book, a very specific meaning. And it means looking at life and you're taking God out of the picture. So, bracketing God out if you like, of life. So looking at life under the sun means looking at it just from a human perspective, leaving God entirely out of the picture. And he does that a lot in this book. So when he looks at life under the sun, he sees an endless stream of pointless movement. Round and round the water goes, the wind goes. There's enormous effort, but nothing ever is achieved. The winds go round and round, the sun goes up and down, the water pours into the sea, but it never gets full. Now it's a way of looking at human development. Huge effort and energy expended. But what has really been achieved? It's interesting. You go back to philosophical writers who were writing towards the end of the 19th century in the late 1800s. And they had this image, and and Christian writers as well, that, that man was in the process of solving all of the world's problems. That from this point, it's only up. That somehow science and technology would solve every single problem. That man was actually on a way to creating utopia on earth. There was a strong belief among Christians, whole sections of Christians, who believed that heaven actually was going to be built on earth. And so they, they sort of reread the book of Revelation, and they they sort of saw heaven actually coming on earth. Man was going to achieve this through all his efforts. But then, in the early 1900s, suddenly, the world changed in people's perceptions because we had the First World War. And all of the stuff that followed from that. And then not long after that, the Second World War. And that whole way of seeing life, actually, it wasn't quite so popular anymore, strangely. That whole view among Christians ceased. In fact, they moved to what is one of the dominant ways of looking at life now, which among Christians in much of the world of a very pessimistic view that, in fact, it's the reverse. The world's going to get worse and worse and worse and worse. And then finally, Jesus will come back and will snatch what's left of the church away out of the the darkness that will be ever-growing. I don't share that perspective, by the way. But that perspective is held by a lot of Christians in various parts of the world. But the fact is... That human beings in many ways have not made a lot of progress. We live in a world where every night millions go to bed hungry. We live in a world where we still have many wars. Our news this week, whenever you look at the news, or at least whenever I've watched the news this week, it's about conflict and war in different contexts and places. And there are a lot of them in our world at this point in time. We have more slaves, more people in slavery in our world today than at any point in the whole of human history. I 
I could just go on just quoting fact, undisputed fact after undisputed fact to illustrate that. Now it's become very politically correct in our UK place. You probably appreciate I don't do political correctness very well or at all. Um, when you take God out of the equation, which they want to do in education more and more these days, I, I heard a leading politician, uh, I think it was last week he was being interviewed, and um, he was interviewed about the idea, uh, in passing, about the idea that God created the world, which he described as a rather bizarre idea. Hello? Yeah, that was his phrase. He just, just chucked it away. He said, well, that's a rather bizarre idea. Yeah, you know, when you take the idea of the fact that God, the fact, by the way, that God created the universe away, when you remove God from the equation, what are you left with? You're left with a universe without reason, a universe without purpose, a universe without any sense of connectedness. You're left with nothing. It's interesting that in, as you know, I'm chair of governors in a, in a primary school. It's interesting, one of the things now that uh, Ofsted are looking for, um, though it's a little bit nebulous, is, is something of, of, sort of like spiritual values to be in schools. Yeah. I'm not quite sure what they mean. I don't think they're quite sure what they mean by that either. But this is rec recognising that if you do away with that whole thing of life when you're bringing children up, they're missing out, in their view, on a very important part of their education. So you take God out of the equation. And what have humans really achieved when you look at our world? In the end, says the writer, it's all wearisome. Nothing really ever changes. I'm working towards a question, by the way, so I hope you're getting ready. Verse 9. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. It reminds me of a rock song. Wasn't it the Who who did that song? Welcome the new boss, same as the old boss. Just showing something of my age there. Um, it's... Uh, What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. You see that, interestingly, in some of the political contexts in some of our countries at the moment, don't you? You have a, the Arab Spring. Turf out one lot of leaders, put in another lot of leaders, and you look at them and think, well, I look at them and think, I'm not terribly sure I can spot the difference. They might be a bit younger, but actually, they seem to be treating their people just as badly as the last lot did. One lot's gone. Welcome the new boss, same as the old boss. What has been done will be done again. There's nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new? Huh. It was here already long ago. It was here before our time. There is no remembrance of men of old. And even those who are yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow. The more things change, says the proverb, the more things remain the same. Without seeing things from God's perspective, history is meaningless cycle. I've got a book of poetry upstairs. And it's got this poem that repeats itself in the book. It keeps coming along. And it just says, history repeats itself. It has to. No one's listening. It comes five or six times in the book of poems. Reflection on life. Without God's perspective, history's a meaningless cycle, going nowhere, no purpose, no direction. And despite what it claims on the packet... There isn't anything ever genuinely, completely new. 
And yet they want us to believe that. Every time you go and buy, is a particular um, shampoo that I buy. I'm not going to advertise it here today. But every time I go and buy another one, it's got new scent, new formula, new packaging. I can't tell the difference in one lot and the last lot, to be quite honest. But of course, it's got to be new because the illusion created is that new is better. But actually, new is just the same. It's simply often that people have forgotten what was before. Feeling happy? So here's my first question. When we look at these 11 verses that we've looked at so far, what are the challenges that this passage brings for us in our society today. What are the things that these verses, what are the challenges from these verses for us today? Mm. They're all difficult questions. In that, you can't, difficult, you've got a process. You can't just look and read to me verse 3 as the answer. Because this is how we have to work with scripture. We have to look at it. We understand what it meant then. And we have to ask the question, what does it mean today? That's the process that we have to go through interpreting scripture. So I can see somebody getting ready. I didn't even get to you. Um, what it means for me today is that I have to leave a godly legacy so that when I'm long gone, um, people will remember that and hopefully follow that. Because the other side of this is that statement in, in one of the Psalms that he, God, secures the work of our hands for eternity. That's the other side. Yeah. Very good. You were about to speak, John, weren't you? I just got this idea that you, you looked like you were going to. I was. Um, I, I guess to me what it says is Ultimately, if you take God out of the picture, what you're basically left with is, and the reason history repeats itself is because it revolves around every man or woman for themselves. And all we'll actually do is choose whatever works for us. Yeah, we might, we might take a few people along for the ride for a while, but basically, as soon as that doesn't suit us, we'll vote for us. And that's, and that's what happens in the political system, that, that basically you vote for yourself and anything else that gets in the way just gets trodden underfoot because why wouldn't you? Yeah, okay. Any other thoughts, reflections? Yeah, be there in a moment. Let's go over here first. Well, I think it just uh, forces us to think about uh, the purpose of life itself. Why, why do we exist? Why... I was the earth created? Yeah. Oh, mine's very much um, like Hannah said, but while, while she was speaking earlier, and I just thought of it like um, if a, a farmer um, plant, you know, plants a crop, um, even if he passes away, he dies, that crop is still there to reap. So in our lives, you know, we can plant good good things into other people's lives. So that's meaningful. Okay. If the population, they're despondent because they feel like this, the challenge for us as Christians is how we're going to address that mm -hmm. for people and how do we bring God into it. Mm -hmm. Very good. If everything is meaningless, then every, nothing has value. Therefore, in a sense, there is no good or evil because that's giving meaning one way or t'other, so it's meaningless. And I think this is in our society that people say, well, there doesn't need to be a purpose. Therefore, anything goes. It's actually at the heart of our society, I think. It's a very, very good observation because if there is no meaning, there is no value. Uh, so life has no value. Other people's lives have no value. Nothing has value. And there is that in, there's elements of that in our culture, but in many other cultures in our world as well. So that's a whole raft. So when you take God out, one of the things that our politicians 
in this country and other countries uh, often don't grasp. You take God out and you ultimately take, don't just take meaning out, you take value out. You undermine the whole lot, the whole deck of cards comes crashing down. Okay, so we've had everything is, uh, life is meaningless, everything is meaningless. The second section we're going to look at now is wisdom is meaningless. Spot the theme here. Verse 12. I, the teacher, so this is him thinking himself now into Solomon, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. I devoted myself to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under heaven. What a heavy burden God has laid on men. I have seen all the things that are done under the sun. You notice under heaven, God's perspective, under the sun, bracketing God out. I have seen all of the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless, a chasing after the wind. What is twisted cannot be straightened. What is lacking cannot be counted. I thought to myself, look, I've grown and increased in wisdom more than anyone who's ruled over Jerusalem before me. I've experienced much of wisdom and knowledge that I applied myself to the understanding of wisdom and also to madness and folly. But I learned that this too is chasing after the wind. For with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. So the writer here, is aiming to look through the eyes of the person who at, that, at the time of writing was considered to be the wisest person ever to live, being King Solomon. And you, you will know the stories about King Solomon that we have in the Bible, the illustration of his incredible wisdom. So he examines all of life leaving out God under the sun. And he concludes that it's as useful as chasing the wind. Have you ever spent time chasing the wind? It's a very powerful image, actually, chasing the wind. Because there actually is nothing there. Yeah. So three points he makes. Firstly, and we'll touch on this again a little bit later, God is behind this frustration. We won't go into the whole theological background of that. It's in Genesis. It's elsewhere in the New Testament as well. But ultimately, God is behind the frustration because human beings, you may recall, decided that they could get along quite nicely without God. Thank you. Secondly, outside of God, human beings, human problems have no solution. History is without hope outside of God. And again, you know, you look and you reflect on our world. If you don't have hope in God, it's not a very nice place to be living in. You look at the issues around, you look at the the, the problems in so many nations, look at the difficulties in our own nation, which are minor compared to those in many others. And thirdly, no matter how clever you are, if you leave out God, life is impossible to understand. Just a couple of quotes here from people I've read this week, a guy called Brown. The universe 
cannot be molded to correspond to any human model of moral sense and order. Put it another way, if you take God out, you don't have any moral sense or any order left in our world. In fact, the more you know, the more grief and sorrow you find. To quote someone else I read this week, open eyes see the injustice of our society. And before you dismiss this as saying, well, pastor, you're just digging about in the Old Testament. You know, New Testament's not like that. Let me read the first of two passages I'm going to read to you from the New Testament. It's from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And I'm going to read from verse 18. See if you see any, hear any echoes here. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise. I will, so the intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand miraculous signs. Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews, foolishness to Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom. The weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. So, question number two. What are the challenges? Sorry, what does this say, this passage that we've looked at? What's the message from this passage to our society today? From this section we've just looked at now, verses 12 down to 18, what is it saying, what is message, what is God saying through this into our society today? Um, I work in science and... Um one of the things that keeps cropping up uh, throughout history and in the history of science is that every time man looks to prove and disprove God, there always seems to be a crucifix up here. I believe the smallest shape in the world is actually the sign of a crucifix. So every time man tries to argue that God doesn't exist, all of a sudden God appears. And that just doesn't make sense. It breaks all sense of wisdom to a lot of people who say that God doesn't exist. Great, thank you perspective um, I think this passage is actually also saying that godly wisdom produces joy why heavenly wisdom produces sorrow could you say that again some people didn't catch that that was really good say it again um, godly wisdom produces joy but heavenly wisdom produces sorrow very good other thoughts what's this saying to our society I'm I'm just struck by the by the number of times the word I occurs in the text 
and he says, I sought to do this, and I sought to do this, and I sought to gain wisdom. But, but the problem is, if God isn't in the picture, even if I've acquired enormous amounts of wisdom, what am I going to do with my so what? Because so what's a philosophical question, and without God, it doesn't need to be answered. So it just becomes a, I've achieved this, aren't I clever? Well, not really, because what are you going to do with it? And as we'll see as we read the next section, when, when you do away with God, what's left but I? What else? What other values have you've got? It, it is all about, and this is a, a, you know, it's a very self-centered way of looking at stuff. And there's going to be uh, even more of that in a moment. Any final bits? We move on to the last section that we're going to look at this morning. Okay, let's go into chapter two. Aren't you glad you came this morning? You see, and I know that some of you are finding this a bit despondent and you'd much rather be having me here preaching a Jesus victorious over absolutely everything type sermon. And uh, I can do that. But actually, we need to be looking at some of these tough questions. This stuff is in Scripture. All Scripture, as Warren's no doubt going to be saying next week when he's uh, talking about the importance of the Bible... All scripture is God-breathed and given to us to help us. And uh, we need to be wrestling with these issues, not just uh, the truth that Jesus is alive, God is victorious over everything and so on. All of that is true. But we need, if we're going to engage with the people around us in our society, we need to wrestle with this sort of stuff as well. So we've had life is meaningless, Everything is meaningless. Wisdom is meaningless. And the final section this morning is called Pleasure is Meaningless. I thought in my heart, verse 1 of chapter 2, Come now, I will test you with pleasure to find out what is good. (laughs) But that also proved to be meaningless. Laughter, I said, is foolish. And what does pleasure accomplish? I try cheering myself with wine, embracing folly, my mind still guiding me with wisdom. I wanted to see what was worthwhile for men to do under heaven during the few days of their lives. I undertook great projects, I built houses for myself. Notice the I all the way through this, by the way. Planted vineyards. I made gardens and parks and planted all kinds of fruit trees in them. I made reservoirs to water groves of flourishing trees. I bought male and female slaves and had other slaves who were born in my house. I also owned more herds and flocks than anyone in Jerusalem before me. I amassed silver and gold for myself and the treasure of kings and princes. I acquired men and women singers and a harem as well. The delights of the heart of man. I became far greater than anyone in Jerusalem before me. In all of this, my wisdom stayed with me. I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. I refused my heart's no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my work, and this was the reward for all my labor. Yet when I surveyed all that my hands had done, And what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. A chasing after the wind. Nothing was gained under the sun. Hedonism is the philosophy that the thing to seek in life is pleasure. Our society in the UK tends to be dominated by that idea. 
that the most important thing in life is pleasure. Pleasure is the thing to get. It is the thing to do. You name it, and the writer tried it. He denied himself no form of pleasure. All the things that our society values are here. Alcohol. Sex. Accumulating money. Accumulating possessions. Experiences. Projects. But at the end, he concluded that under the sun, none of this is of lasting value. And yet our society, isn't it, is so dominated by the searching for and seeking of pleasure. Just look at the adverts. Those you see on TV or cinema or in newspapers, magazines, billboards. What are they selling you? They're selling you the illusion that if you do this, you buy this product, you go to this place, you have this experience, you will be enriched because of the pleasure you will receive. They even do it selling soap powder. You know, whatever you look at, that's how it's sold. It's all about accumulating experiences of pleasure. There's a passage in the New Testament, which I want to read to you. It's the second one we're going to, I'm going to read to you this morning. Um, It's from Philippians, chapter, where are we? Chapter 3. And uh, I'm going to read from verse 4. If you're easily offended, by the way, you might... When I finish reading this, you might want to put your fingers in your ears for a few moments. I'll warn you when we're getting there, okay? So this is uh, Philippians 3, verses 4 to 8. Though I myself have reason for such confidence, if anyone thinks he has reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more, says Paul, circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness faultless. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ." What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ. Now that word rubbish is a very polite word for the Bible. That isn't what the word means. Easily offended, put your fingers in your ears. It actually, in modern parlance, would be the word shit. It's, it's excrement, if you want the um, uh, Times version. But if you want it as, it as it is, that's the word. So he looks at this. Paul, uh, Warren was saying the other week, weren't he, when he was preaching, that there are swear words in Scripture. You don't read them in the NIV because it makes it rather polite for you. But it's a very, very strong expression here. I consider all of this, and there's his education, all the things he's achieved in life, his standing, whatever was to my profit. I now consider this shit that I may gain Christ. It's all complete rubbish. And, you know, in our society, all these things that the writer of Ecclesiastes lists, albeit 
you know, he's writing two and a half thousand years ago, but you put that into modern day terms, it's the sort of stuff that people go after today. So what is the challenge from where we're going in chapter two? What's the challenge that brings to our context today? I see a hand at the back. I didn't see who it belonged to. Okay, I could just see this hand. I couldn't see the person. Um, it means we don't go after shit. <laughs> well put. I think a part of it is to try, because it's, people get caught up in this you only live once mentality. So that's where all this seeking, yeah, you, it's okay to do that because you only live once. So the challenge is to try to keep away from that you only live once mentality. So therefore, go ahead and do whatever pleases you and forget everything else. So that's, I think that's the challenge. Mm -hmm. Because actually our focus is on eternity. We set our mind, says Paul elsewhere, on the things that are above, not on the things that are here and now. Very good. Yeah, um, all, all, lots of things are like education and so on. Um, if we recognise that they're um, God-given and to, um, you know, <clears throat> they become sacred in God's hands and he will use those things for his purpose. And there's nothing wrong with pleasure um, but, but when we recognise that, you know, God's given us a, compa a capacity for pleasure, but it has to be sort of... Uh, Oh, everything needs to be sanctified by God. Mm -hmm. Yes, because he's looking at this, remember, bracketing God out. So, good observation, yeah. Pleasures are meaningless. My first question in my head is, pleasure, what's the definition of pleasure? What brings me pleasure will be different from yours. Um, you know, there are different types of children are sources of pleasure, marriages, spouses. Um, in the news, or in the last week, I, I picked the information about a couple whose the children killed them and buried them in the back garden, and then started spending their money. Money is meant to bring pleasure, but they were killed for. And so, in that instance, that the children have not brought them pleasure, but sorrow, pain. Um, my uh, uh, perception would be that okay, God has given us and blessed us, like Carol said, all these things to enjoy from, but. They shouldn't be the be all and they shouldn't overwhelm and overtake our lives, our thoughts, our practice. We should maintain our focus um, in God and, and, and sort of get things in perspective. Jobs bring pleasures, but it shouldn't be, it shouldn't take over um, our lives. In my place of work, we've, we've, people have been going through redundancies, the university is being restructured, all departments. And um, Timmy said, Timmy asked me how I felt about this. And I said, well, God has put me there for a reason. I'm not going to let all this transformational overwhelm me. Um, and uh, that I've put it in God's hand. He's in control and he will manifest his, himself in this situation. Of all the hundreds of departments in Brunel, all the departments were restructured except the library where I worked. Um, I, it didn't overwhelm me. It brought me pleasure, yes, but not to that lens. So my point being that we should maintain our focus in God, in God's message, in God's kingdom, um, and not let things going on around us, pleasures, everything, families, money, they shouldn't be the be all, they shouldn't overwhelm us. Great, thank you. Couple, th last three. Yes, the script, the scripture says, what profit a man to gain the whole world and to lose his soul? to gain off uh, riches, sex, and other stuff, and lose the purpose that God has created you for, to serve him. So what God has put into us is spirit and, is, and, and to lose our soul because of all the vanities and everything, as Solomon was saying, all is nothing. God actually understands when we feel like everything has no meaning and we lose hope. God's been there. And there must be some reason for us feeling like that. 
perhaps to help us identify with other people. So if you are feeling like that today, that, that everything's meaningless for you, know there is hope. Thank you. Final two. Well, in this chapter, as you've said, everything was revolving around the I, I, I. Everything I do is for my pleasure. And But in the New Testament, it says that God gives us work and he gives us ability so that we will have that enough to share with the people in need. And that is true happiness, not revolving around ourselves. Yeah. Thank you. Final one. Um, you've been talking about people seeking after pleasure and doing this and that and the other. But I'm thinking that there's a huge number of people in every society who never get to that, who long for it, who, for an example, do the lottery every week and plan what they do if they had millions. And... It's all meaningless um, because what God's got for us is for everyone. No one's left out. And that's, that's huge. Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to pray for us in a moment. Two things that I want you to take away from this section so far. Uh, life without God has no meaning. Life without God has no meaning. And without God, even the best has no lasting value. Because it is God who gives it eternal value. So let's take hold of that and allow that to frame how we see stuff going on around us, how we see society, and maybe to challenge some of the things in our lives. You know, when you live in a society that has a certain set of values, it's very easy for those values to become embedded in your own life without realising it. So the seeking of pleasure just for itself it's right, God has created all sorts of... I mean, if God wasn't into pleasure, he wouldn't have made the world such a beautiful place. So many shades of green and blue and all the rest of it, and the, and the flavours and aromas. But it's to be enjoyed under God. You take God out, and it's just a meaningless I, 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 I. Without God... Life has no meaning. Without God, even the best has no lasting value. Let's remember that in our own lives this week and beyond. Let's allow God's word to challenge us about the values of our society, about the more that we consume, the better life is. The more that we accumulate, the better life is. Let's be quiet for a moment. You might want to say something to God yourself and then I'm going to lead us in prayer in just a moment. Father God, thank you that under you, life has meaning. That under you, life has significance. That under you, there is point to what we're doing. That under you, as we live our lives, you give our lives and the work of our hands eternal meaning and significance. Father God, we invite you to take your word and to challenge our lives, our values, that where the values that we live by are not really under you, that your word will challenge that. And that as we talk to people around us, You'll help us to see through the myths and lies that are communicated by the culture around us. In Jesus' name. Amen. 
We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.